what I'd like to do is talk about some of the issues that Indonesia faces as it develops. And we're going to look at a little bit of history as well and see where Indonesia's come from to try and understand what the problems might be going forward uh, where we're going. Okay, so this diagram is my starting point. And remember the question is, why is growth good? Okay, so um, because you sometimes get in the media talks about economic growth causing lots of damage, rising inequality. Some people get rich, some people would get poor. And, and we see congestion, we see problems associated with economic growth, we see pollution and all these sorts of things. So, of course, economists like to talk about economic growth and we need to step back a bit and think about well, what's good about economic growth. And fundamentally, the reason why we like economic growth is because of this problem. So this is world poverty, number of people living on a, a real income of less than a dollar a day, which is considered as a benchmark the World Bank uses for absolute poverty. The number of people living on uh, less than a dollar a day, the number of million people, going back to 1820, the poverty levels since then have just gone up and up and up and up. And we know that countries have got richer over that time. So poverty is going up and there's also economic growth. So why is poverty going up even though countries are getting richer? Population. Yes, populations, exactly, yes, both right. So the population, the world population has been growing as well. So even though some countries are being richer, the number of people has been growing much faster, and so the number of people living in poverty has gone up. But um, it's not all bad news because in the last uh, two or three decades, we've seen this. So for the first time ever, the number of people, absolute number of people living in poverty has gone down. The first time in, in human history. All right. Now another question, does anyone know why? So this reduction in world poverty is all because of China's economic growth. China's economic growth got 200 to 400 million people out of poverty, right? And that's a big enough country that makes a big difference to the world. And so, of course, what we want to do around the world is replicate this in all the other countries, in India, right? And, of course, Indonesia and every other country. So you can't do that without economic growth. Right? The poor countries have to grow in order to reduce poverty. So the poverty headcount, that is the number of million people living in poverty, went down by around four to 600 million people. Now, economic growth has also reduced poverty in Indonesia. Okay? Um, since the 1980s, I'll show you a chart in a minute, the number of people living in poverty has gone down by, by half what it used to be. Okay? Um, and in recent years, poverty has continued to decline but as we see, it's, it's not, perhaps not going as fast as it might. So this is a graph comparing the number of people. This is a different benchmark. It's, it's uh, $2 a day, so it's a slightly different level of poverty. It's the number of people living uh, less than $2 a day as a percentage of the population. So back in the 1980s, 80% 80 of Indonesians had less than $2 a day. Right? And now it's only 40%. And as you can see, that compares, uh, you know, it's a little bit less than India. There's a percentage of the population. India's much bigger, of course. Um, similar to the Philippines now, um, but still higher than, and higher than China, most noticeably, right? When you look at China's change has gone from nearly 100% in the 1980s down to uh, less than 20% now. This is more recently, and this is a, a benchmark, this is the official Indonesian government benchmark of what poverty means, and their benchmark is 354,000 rupees per month. Right? So it's pretty, it's pretty poor. Right? So that's about, that's about a, it's less than a dollar, a US dollar a day. Right? Now, of course, you see it's been going down since 2006. So Indonesia's economy has been it's recovered since the Asian financial crisis. We'll have a look at that. It's been going down, but you can see over the last few years it's, it's not been continued down. It's kind of stabilized. And so this is a bit of a problem for Indonesia right now. How do we get back on track to keep this number coming down? And also, although it's going down, there are still, still 27 million people in Indonesia living below that benchmark. Okay, so this uh, then raises the question, well, why am I so confident? How do I know? The economic growth is going to deliver poverty re reduction. Why am I so confident? And actually, you know, I'm a represent of representative of my profession. Most economists believe that growth will reduce poverty. 
But of course, well, some people will say, well, no, because the rich get richer and the poor don't get any richer, and they may even get poorer. And so economic growth doesn't necessarily, necessarily reduce poverty. It just makes the rich even richer and creates more inequality. So how, why do I think that's not the case? Why do I think that economic growth is going to help the poor? So this is the next question. Why are some countries rich and some countries poor? That is, how is it we do have rich countries where there is no poverty? That's the same question. So um, wh wh where are the rich countries? The rich countries, let's take USA, for example, or, or some Western European countries, France and the UK. They're all wealthy countries. Japan's wealthy. There's many wealthy countries. But these, Western Europe, they became rich as a result of slow growth. They never had, there was no Western European economic miracle. Like, uh, there was no Jap you know, Japan, Japan economic miracle. There was no Western economic miracle. Growth rates never got much above 2 or 3% per year in Western Europe. But they just persisted over 200 years and eventually became very rich. So, and if we go back 2,000 years, right, we go back there, well, everyone was poor. Every, all countries were poor. Right? In China or Europe, everybody was pretty much the same. So we know we've come from a situation where everybody was poor and everybody was pretty much the same to a situation where some countries are now fabulously rich and some countries are still amazingly poor. So how did that happen? So here's a graph. I'm going to put the graph on in a second. This doesn't go back, this goes back a thousand years, all right, back to the year 1000. So we've got um, ancient Roman Empire here, just falling apart. Then we come through the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages in Europe, and there's a Renaissance, and then we get up to here. So somehow we're going to get from this number down here, somewhere down here, where everyone's very, where the country is very poor. I'm going to look at France and the United Kingdom. So back here we know they're very poor. Now we know that their incomes are around $30,000. $20,000 per person. How do we get from one to the other? What would the graph look like? It happened like this. Well, if I extrapolate this back, some people have tried to extrapolate this back even further in time. Of course, the data get very difficult, but I'll talk about the data in a second. You go back all the way back to minus 1,000, minus 2,000, because there's no growth here. It's just flat. There was zero growth. So for most of human history, the growth rate, GDP per person or any other sort of national income measure, the growth rate was zero. Then around about the 1500, it starts to bump up a half a percent, one percent. And then finally you get to the 1800s and it starts to get two percent, three percent, and then like this. So it's not been, it has been a long, slow process since about 1800, but before 1800 there was zero growth. Okay, so there's a sudden change. Why did that happen? For most of human history, there was no economic growth. From about 1000 BC to 1600 AD, living standards did not increase, okay? And the reason they know that is they look back at church records, look back at village records, and they can tell what people were eating and how many loaves of bread a day a family had. And if you're a poor person, your consumption is all of your income is consumed. So your consumption is equal to your income. Number of loaves of bread, that's pretty much all you could consume was carbohydrates and maybe a tiny little bit of milk or meat. And one of the reasons for this is called the, I uh, stress one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons is called the Malthusian trap. You know, back in, the, uh, in, in olden days, if you like, every time people got a little bit of more income, a little bit more richy, richer, then family population increased as well. So fertility rates went up. So rather than people getting, households getting richer, they just got larger. And, and rather than cities getting richer, they just spread across Asia and across Europe. And people spread out across the world from Africa into Europe into Asia. People spread out, the human kind spread across the world, but it just spread and nobody got any richer, just more people. If you compare, for example, back in the year 1 AD, the United Kingdom's GDP per person has been estimated to be about $600 per year. All right? Compare that with the Congo today, it's only $260 a year. But the question is, what changed? So something between 1600 and 1870, things changed. Yeah, so the Industrial Revolution happened, right? Now, um, the Industrial Revolution didn't just happen overnight. It happened very, very slowly. And it followed about 200 years of the Renaissance where people like Leonardo da Vinci and Galileo were, were rediscovering knowledge of the ancient Greeks. And the people were thinking about this knowledge and putting it into practice. But 200 years it took for those knowledges to diffuse through to society. And then it wasn't until about the 1820s to 1875 
when you start getting the application of things like machines, basic simple machines to make cloth and, and, and steam engines to drag trucks out of uh, uh, mines and things like that. So it's the age of coal and steam and factories. So 1820 to 1875 in England first and then France, the Industrial Revolution started taking place. So it wasn't until that happened that income, living standards started to rise. But of course, it took, living standards didn't rise very fast because all the people, lots of people came out of the countryside into the cities. The cities became overcrowded, there was child labor in the factory. And some of you might have read uh, Charles Dickens and you get a picture of life in England at this time. It's quite miserable. But it was a start, it was the start of economic growth. So growth rates finally became positive only in the 18, uh, 1800s. England got rich, France got rich, other Western countries became rich, Americas became rich, North Americas became Canada, right? There were some colonies like Australia, New Zealand sort of did all right. But some countries just got left behind and they didn't get industrialized. Okay? And some colonies did well and some colonies didn't do so well. And so people are trying to understand, well, what, why did this happen? And what were the key things? Was there a key ingredient that was missing that industrialization led to rising incomes in one place and, and not in another place? So you have to have some entrepreneurial freedom, free markets, so people can make things in exchange and they can specialize in what they want. They can specialize in producing something and still consume what they want by selling. So you have to have the right to be able to trade. You have to have the right to be able to produce things. You have to have a system of governance or institutions that protects your rights to do these things. So if I have a dispute, there's some legal system and I know the framework and I understand it. Without all these things, markets can't work and people can't <coughs> produce things, they can't invest. And we need education. In order for industrialization to occur, you have to have an educated workforce. It doesn't have to be highly educated at first, but people have to be able to get access to education if they want it. So these are some basics. Um, but still it's not the whole picture. They're still missing things. We don't understand the importance of these different things. So Indonesia comes off this fairly low starting point, right? It still has high levels of poverty. Inequality is rising, right? And the only way that we can raise everybody's standard of living is not by redistrib redistributing income because there's not enough of it. We have to have economic growth to get uh, the, everybody can um, income can rise through economic growth. So, as you know, during the Suharto era, Indonesia was growing quite rapidly. Right? It was one of the East Asian tigers. Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, they're all growing very, very rapidly. All right? And then, um, and Malaysia and Indonesia, right, Thailand were all following fast on their heels. And everybody, and I was a young academic, everybody thought this is it, right? Because when I was an uh, undergraduate university, People told us, my professors told us, well, the world's ever, some professors argued that the world was always going to be poor countries and rich countries, and there was never, the poor countries could never catch up because the rich countries wanted to keep the poor countries poor. So East Asian miracle changed all that. It threw all those theories out about development, traps, and so forth. Countries could become rich. Okay, so here's Indonesia's growth. This is the Sahata era uh, from, as you know more than I do, through this period here. And then we get to this little event here, which was the uh, East Asian financial crisis. And Indonesia took quite a big hit. And so it took, you know, about eight years or so for GDP to recover just to where it was, had been. And at that time, poverty rates jumped up, inequality jumped up, and it really set things back. But still, since then, fortunately, the growth looks to be almost back on track. It hasn't quite got back to the Suharto era growth rates yet. It's slightly lower, but it's, it's robust growth, so that's good. And in the meantime, of course, Indonesia has become a democracy. I'm going to talk about that a little bit too, because that's a good thing. Okay, so that's basically the Indonesia's growth. And then, uh, so the first period, we're looking at growth rates of about 5% per year, which is just slightly less than the East Asian miracle countries. Uh, since then, it's been around 3 or 4% per year. Yeah, the East Asian miracle countries, when they really got cracking, around 7 or 8% per year. And of course, there's another country that since it has grown at 7 or 8% per year, which is China. So how does this compare with what China did over the same period? That's how it compares. So that's the difference between 4 to 5 percent growth per year and 7 to 8 percent growth per year, you see? And look at this, you know, for all these years, the Sahara China was much poorer than Indonesia. China's less than half 
income per capita of Indonesia. But in 1980, of course, they undertook reforms. They said we're not going to, they didn't say we're not going to be socialists, but they did introduce markets and let people make those investment decisions, let people exchange things, let people specialise. And so under a sort of somewhat controlled capitalist system, they managed to achieve these fantastic growth rates. And they're very, very conscious about, they're very um, deliberately followed Singapore. China passed um, Indonesia GDP per capita back in uh, the mid-2000s. So this is a number of interesting implications for Indonesia. What could have gone wrong? What could they have done better? And what does it mean now that China's this big country right next door to us? China's going to continue on this projection, let's say, that's 6 or 8% per year. Indonesia's down here at around 3 or 4% per year. What does that mean for Indonesia as well? Well, it might mean that you know, it's going to be very hard to ever catch up if we can't get our growth rate going up steeper. And that's why we need to be concerned about the middle income trap. This is a diagram that the World Bank produced. This is the idea of the middle income trap. So it's a bit complicated, but I'll explain it. And so if you're very poor in the 1960s and you're very poor in, the, um, in 2008, then you'd be down here in a dot here, right? If you're very rich in the 1960s and still very rich in 2009, then you'd be up here, like um, well, USA is up here. So most countries, because there's a bit of a line here, most countries haven't changed that much. But some countries are up in this box. So these countries were countries that were, that were poor in the 1960s but have moved up to become rich countries in 2009. So they've gone out of the middle into the rich country group. And the ones we talked about, Singapore and Hong Kong, for example. So the point they're making is that most countries that were middle income, the big cluster here in the middle, most countries that were middle income in the 1960s were still only middle income countries in, in the 2000s. They didn't get out of that. So there seems to be a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of countries. You can think of them like Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, a lot of South American countries. They're not very, very poor. They're not as poor as African countries. They're somewhat richer than Indonesia. But for all that wealth, they've never managed to catch up with the United States. Right? So what's gone wrong there? So this is the idea of the middle income trap. So the expectation was that other Eastern Asian current countries would follow Taiwan and South Korea and become rich. Right? But only China continued that path. And so some of these East Asian countries, and we're talking about Indonesia now, and Thailand, right, um, and Malaysia, are starting to look more like the Latin American countries than the, you know, than the Taiwans and the Hong Kongs. Okay, so Indonesia is catching up with the United States, but it's happening very, very slowly. Right, so this is the gap. We put United States on the same graph. This is the same data I had before. There's China. That's the big acceleration you saw there, but when you compare it to the United States, so there's still like a tenfold difference here between per capita incomes in the United States and per capita incomes in China or in Indonesia. Right. So how long will it take China to catch up with the United States? And how long will it take Indonesia to catch up with the United States? <laughs> right. Well, I can tell you, I've done, the, I've, I've done it. Right? But now, this is just a simple example. Assuming that China continues to grow at 6%, which is probably unrealistic, 6 or 7%, it'll slow down as it gets closer. But let's just, as an experiment, let's just think about that, right? So um, how long would it take to catch up with the USA in terms of living standards? So here's the data, same, same graph, just squashed up a bit because I need more space. So here's Indonesia, China down here, United States up there, and now I'm going to project it out a number of years to see how long it takes at the same growth rate, right? Now the thing is, of course, the United States is not staying still. It's growing as well. It's growing around 2%. So it's not a constant target. You're trying to catch up. So project this out for a few years, and you get a graph like this. So this is the nature of growth, you see. It just builds and builds and builds and builds. Exponential. So it only take China to 2050. And that's a fairly pessimistic scenario. I mean, some people just, they kind of spend a lot of time arguing about data and which is the best data and which is the worst data. I've used here the sort of worst case for China. So they could do it faster than that. But say 2050 for China. For Indonesia, well, so they haven't got very far, right? By 2050, <laughs> it's still down here, right? Okay, so um, yeah, 91 years to catch up. 
it won't catch up to 2108. And this is just an example. There's lots of discussions that people have about measurement and what the real level of income is and whether we should use other measures of, of comparison. Here what I've do, we've done is just taken Indonesia and China's GDP and converted it to US dollars at the current exchange rate. And that may not be a good thing to do for many reasons. There might be different measures. So there's a whole science behind you know, these kind of measurement things. We can get into that in depth if you want to, but not, not here today. And so you know, what's a reasonable projection about where the middle income band would be over this period, the range of, of, of incomes where you're still a middle income country? And of course, as the world grows, being in the middle also, the range grows as well. And this range here is 10% of US GDP to 50% of US GDP, which is the current sort of middle income band as defined by the World Bank. So even by 2050, Indonesia wouldn't even be one third of the way through the middle income band if it carries on the current growth. So for, middle, for Indonesia to avoid this middle income trap, it needs to punch up. Right? It needs rapid growth. It needs 7, 8% of growth for 20 years. And that will do it. It will catch China. It will catch China if it does that. Even India is now growing around 6, 7%. Right? If India can do it, anyone can do it. So um, it's a big challenge for the political, big challenge for the economists. But that's what's going to deliver declines in poverty where we started. That's also assuming that you carry on at 4%. It's possible you have another crisis. It's possible the growth slows down for various reasons. So lots of bad things can happen along that path. That's why you really need a 7%, 8% type of growth rate to, to get there. So you need to avoid becoming like Brazil. Right. So then I'm just going to conclude very quickly with some uh, sort of, you know, what, what next? So that's, that's the problem. What are the, how do we solve this problem? And of course, if we knew how to solve the problem, I wouldn't be here talking to you now, right? This is, this is you know, you're the future generation, so these are going to be your problems to solve. But we can pass the ball and we can say, well, here's what we think of the issues. So one of the things, that big advantages that Indonesia's got over China is democracy. And... Why is that a big advantage? Many people say, well, democracy, yeah, it's nice, it's fair and all that, but it means we can't do things. We can't build new freeways because people protest and we can't have free trade deals because people protest and we can't, you know, it, resists, it creates a, a resistance to change. But at some stage, I think personally, China's going to have to become democratic because right, in a globalised world, people will demand increasing rights. And so... China's going to face that challenge, and it's going to be very destabilizing. Indonesia's it's covered that hurdle already. Right? So as long as Indonesia can continue to de deliver growth that's balanced and lets everybody get richer, then there, won't be any, there shouldn't be any challenges to democracy. Um, so it might be a case of the hare versus the tortoise. Right? The hare takes off, it gets way in front, but the tortoise just plods along and it gets there. And the hair gets tripped up because the hair, being China, has to overcome this hurdle of democracy still. And the, and, and the whole institutional structure that goes around democracy and people's expectations about rights and so forth. Okay, manufacturing. This is an interesting research topic that some of us have looked at because Indonesia's got a, a manufacturing sector, but the accusation is, well, what happened is China boomed and it crowded out Indonesia's manufacturing. Indonesia wasn't able to get a, a foothold in world manufacturing exports because it was being undercut by prices from China. What Indonesia has got, of course, is a big resource sector. Um, so it's a question, does that resource sector hinder its manufacturing sector? The resource sector creates lots of demand, it raises prices, it means that manufacturing is not competitive. Okay, so Indonesia needs to continue on its reform process, right? And we have protests and so forth, and that's fine as long as they're peaceful protests, right? People have to engage. People have to be, feel they're part of the process of, of what's happening. But we need, the politicians do need to continue the reforms. They need to open up trade relations with other countries. They need to eliminate subsidies that distort prices um, and all the usual things that we talk about in economics. So markets, one thing we know from the Industrial Revolution and looking at the countries that experienced growth and those that didn't, is that markets were crucial. Right? Free markets, ability to trade, and the institutions to protect those markets. So the closer you can get to that, the better. And then lastly, education. Right? 
So Indonesia's got very broad-based education. It's got lots of schools. It doesn't do so well on the quality. So in the rural areas, quality schooling's not as high as it might be. So again, there's geographic tra challenges, particular problems for Indonesia needs to face. So how do we raise the quality of schooling and how do we raise access to schooling for everybody? So that's my talk. Thank you.